Today I'll be talking about modeling fluid flow behavior in microbially recharged coal bed methane reservoirs. Uh, before I start, I would like to uh, acknowledge the help, of doc help and advice of Dr. Harpalani at SIU over the duration of my grad school. So to begin with, what is, what is microbially enhanced coal bed methane? The idea is uh, there is native microbial population within the <coughs> coal seams that exists naturally. So, and the Id idea is to feed these microbes a good nutrient diet so that they can convert the carbon percent in coal to methane. And we can use the methane as a source of energy, as a cleaner source of energy. So the entire process, we want to do it in situ. We want to feed the microbes that are present in the coal reservoirs a nutrient solution so that they, they have enough metabolic energy and then they convert the methane, <coughs> coal to methane. So that's the basic idea. And uh, in that, there are different ways that we can apply this technology. Our interest <coughs> is to gasify the coal uh, that's in situ by injecting nutrients from the surface, let it soak for a certain period of time so that the microbes does it work, the methane gets formed, met methane gets stored, and then we take it out, uh, put it to good use. So that's the basic idea behind the work I'm, that I'm presenting today, in which the entire technical feasibility of this <coughs> kind of technology is two-pronged. That we need to take care or take enough care that enough bi biogenic methane is being produced because at the end of the day, we are gonna sell that methane to get the monies out. So we need microbial approach, microbial research to produce a lot of methane. And once that methane's formed, where is that methane gonna go? How is it gonna be stored? How is it gonna flow within the reservoir? So there is this reservoir aspect of things like how would the produced gas and the nutrient solution flow <coughs> within the reservoir while we are trying to extract it or even produce it. So out of these two prongs, the current standing is that a lot of work has been done by microbiologists all over the world, specifically in the United States, uh, where they reported <coughs> the methane generation rates for different types of coal, which had different types of microbial diversities, and they engineered microbial solutions to study, uh, <coughs> to maximize the methane generation and minimize CO2 generation. And they have also looked at reduced cost methods. However, we need to know how this methane is gonna flow. And in that, there are a lot of missing insights. Actually, all the insights are missing. No one has done any work prior to our study from a reservoir flow and transport behavior aspect. And in order to do that, uh, we need to look at gas storage and stored gas transport behavior in a microbial enhanced coal bed methane reservoir. And it doesn't, now it makes sense that the goal of this work is not to look at the microbial aspect of things. The goal of this work is to provide reservoir insights both experimental and modeling that would give us some idea about the gas storage and transport behavior. The work I'm presenting today particularly deals with the gas transport behavior. So the, that is the crux of my work that I'm presenting here, in which it is very important to talk about the physical structure of coal because it's the physical structure that governs the transport of molecules within the, <coughs> within the reservoir. Coal is a dual porosity uh, rock where we have the larger fracture system which are greater than 50, micron, 50 nanometers wide, which make up the face and the butt cleat system. Those are the fractures, macropores. And those big fractures surround the coal matrix. You see this red and yellow? This solid block of coal is filled up with micropores, small pores that are less than two nanometers in size, something like a sponge. So this dual porosity structure, the macropores and the micropores, they affect the flow of gases or flow of fluids in a coal reservoir. And how does that happen? <coughs> methane usually is formed over the geological process of coal formation and it's stored because of the high pressures that exist over there. And as we reduce the pore pressure that's holding the methane in place, the methane molecules, which are adsorbed or stuck onto the surface of the micropores, due to the loss of pore pressure, they get detached from the surface. So that's the first stage. It desorbs from the pore surface. Now that it's a free molecule, it needs to find its way within the pore network of the coal matrix that is being surrounded by the cleats or the fractures until it finds its way to the larger fracture zones where it flows in a Darcyan way. So it follows the Darcyan law until it reaches the well bore from where we extract the methane to the surface. So first it dissolves from the micropores, diffuses within the micropore geometry until it reaches the larger fractures. There we use the parameter of permeability <coughs> to characterize how fast my methane molecule is gonna flow. And then 
the faster it is, more economical it is for us. If we have a very slow, slow flowing reservoir, it's not very economically feasible. So that's the entire idea behind it. So our focus, we have in the past, as a part of this main study, this study we have reported changes in the desorption and diffusion characteristics. Today we are going to talk about changes in the dark scene flow characteristics. So we are just focusing our entire talk on the cleat flow, which brings the question, how do we characterize permeability? At the end of the day, I have a molecule of methane and a <coughs> sample of high permeability, the molecule will be flowing through it very fast, whereas in a sample of low permeability, the molecule will be flowing very slow. And quite evidently, if my fracture porosity is high, if I have high fracture porosity, I will have high permeability. If I have low fracture porosity, I will have low permeability. So in order to characterize permeability, I can either directly measure flow or I can directly measure porosity. The traditional methods look at measuring measurement of flow, but then again, it is directly related. It is a function of porosity. Uh, my interest was <coughs> based on measurement of porosity and in turn understanding flow, the behavior of flow within these reservoirs. That is specifically because this is a new area and measurement of flow requires extensive setups. So this would give us an idea going into this kind of technology as to what can be expected. In order to do that, how do we measure pore sizes? Very simple, we take a, take a piece of coal, intact coal, which has all the micropores and the <coughs> uh, big fractures. We image it, we don't use a cartoon microscope, we use a high resolution scaling electron microscope, that's what we use for this study. And we did not do, <coughs> we conducted tests on six samples, we imaged multiple locations, we had about 600 images, we took all those coal and treated them with engineered microbial media, and we measured gas production from it. After uh, 60 days of gas production, <coughs> we took these same coal, coal samples, we re-imaged them again at the same locations. I'm not gonna present you 600 images because that would be a waste of time. I'm gonna show you two sets of images that cover the entire aspect of whatever we saw. It, it covers the behavior of most of the samples, most of the samples that we saw in our study. So in essence, we image these samples before and after bioconversion and look at what kind of physical changes in physical structure happened in those coal samples. <clears throat> so, which brings me to my first sample, sample I1. Very interesting. We see an inverse T fracture where we have a wider horizontal fracture and a vertical fracture which is narrower. After bioconversion, it's very clear that the wider fracture increased, increased in its width. So right now it's just qualitative and the narrower fracture decreased in its aperture, decreased in its width. The decrease in width of fractures was the most prevalent observation across, that we saw across all these samples that we imaged. <clears throat> Over 95% of the fractures that we saw decreased in its aperture, but from three fractures. All three fractures were greater than a specific size of five microns. I don't know where that number came from, but whichever fractures like this, which were greater than five microns or wider than five microns to begin with, increased in its width post bioconversion. All other fractures decreased in its cleat aperture post bioconversion. This was sample number one. Sample number two is more representative of what we saw for the other, <coughs> other samples, where we have an angular fracture here, which after re-imaging that, we saw a decrease in its width. Until now, this, this description was qualitative, but we needed a quantitative understanding to if we were to measure flow. We have good image processing <coughs> techniques, which allowed us to extract information, porosity information from the images by simple segmentation techniques. And we could identify the black pixels as fractures and the green pixels as the solid matrix block. So the flow would be happening or Darcyan flow would be happening in these dark, dark <coughs> pixels. So this was the first sample, this was the second sample. So now we are in a state that we can quantify these images. This change in the images, what is happening to the porosity from there, we found out that sample I1, which had a, a, a porosity of about 0 0.049, 0449, increased in its sample porosity. And uh, based on the sign convention, that it gives a negative pore strain of, <coughs> of 1.619. So increase in porosity, like I said, only 5% of our samples showed that. The other sample, which was representative of the major observations, saw a positive pore strain, that is decrease in porosity, of about 0.492. Very good. We, we started off with a qualitative image. We narrowed it down to quantitative understanding where we can measure things. Now what do we do with these numbers? There has to be a way for us to understand these numbers 
if we are to understand how flow can be predicted in the reservoirs. So what we did, we scratched our heads and finally we were able to modify <coughs> equations that measure flow. The red underline were pre-existing equations and we were, which, were, which had functions of geomechanical parameters and softive strain and we were able to include these strains that were being observed in our <coughs> samples due to bioconversion into the governing equations. These governing equations, this is the governing equation of the stress state that exists in a reservoir. Change in stress state means change in strain that changes <coughs> fracture sizes. That will in turn regulate flow rate. So from starting from these governing equations, we can derive a whole bunch of equations where we can hold, look at a whole bunch of parameters. I am looking at Darcy and flow permeability. So then we were able to modify the pre-existing Shi and Durujan model uh, to include our newly found strain in coals due to bioconversion. So we took these strains that we found in image data, we developed a model, and then we, from there onwards, we looked at how, what this bioconversion induced strain did to our reservoir. Before we look at the effect of strains, we need to talk about coal. Coal has a very, if, and this is the, <coughs> we start depleting at a high pressure, or uh, in situ reservoir, as we deplete, as we take more methane out, the permeability of the reservoir keeps on increasing. That's very good because more the permeability, higher would be the flow rates. But why does it increase? The very interesting characteristic of coal reservoirs is, the, you remember the cleats I talked about? As, as the gas gets dissolved from the coal matrix, the coal matrix shrinks in size. So the matrix block after desorption, after release of gas, shrinks in size the cleats get widened up and that happens over the life of the producing reservoir. Thereby, there is a jump in permeability. That's very good. That's good from a production perspective. So this is the response of a reservoir pre-bioconversion when there was no treatment. Now I take the same reservoir, I subject it to treatment and let's ask for sample I2 where we saw there was <coughs> decrease in porosity. That porosity Porosity and permeability has a, have a cubic relationship. So initially there is, there was significant decrease in the initial permeability and that decrease given the cubic relation, interrelationship between porosity and permeability manifested itself throughout the life of the reservoir. So our expected jump in the permeability of a reservoir pre-bioconversion was severely stunted because of our bioconversion. However, there was a silver, silver lining to this. What? Our sample I1, which had a wider fracture to begin with, showed a massive jump in permeability expected because the porosity increased, so did the permeability, and given the cubic relationship, there was about a 4,000 time increase in the model permeability. Yes, these are all modeling results, but what does this prove? If we can find a reservoir which have high permeability to begin with, even though there, there, there might be chances that there would be swelling up of the matrix, I can still probably find a highway where a lot of the flow can happen at very high rates. So this, that was the insight that we got. This was the more common expected behavior. That was the more uncommon gold mine behavior. So that was what we measured in permeability. And like I said, my idea was to measure porosity and understand flow rate. But that can't be on a different plane. There has to be some interrelationship between the measurement of flow rates and the measurement of porosity. So in order to find the common link, what we did, uh, the first study that was done on measuring permeability during the change in permeability during bioconversion was done in the University of Alberta in Calgary, where they did not work on coal cores, they worked on a packed coal fines, and they saw there was about a 61% drop in permeability due to the process of bioconversion. Very similar to the results seen in our study via the imaging approach. Because the study was done on coal pack and not on intact coal cores, at SIU we looked at a sample. We looked at the permeability before and after bioconversion, and the permeability decreased from 1.09 milliDarcy's to about 0.33. That means a very similar 69% drop. Compare that to our sample I2 via the imaging approach. My imaging approach predicts a 77% drop. So there are similarities that we see via imaging approach. The imaging approach took me eight weeks to do. The permeability test took me about 18 months. So the flow tests are very long, long and time intensive, whereas the imaging tests are very, it's very flexible. 
There is a slight overestimation in the imaging approach, primarily because we were imaging under unstressed conditions. We, and in the modeling, we assume constant soft stress, strain, and geomechanical parameters, but that can be changed uh, when the time comes. But the good thing, the silver lining is that sample I1, which had wider fractures to begin with, predicted a 122% increase in the permeability as compared to our unconverted or the virgin CBM reservoir. So what do I conclude from this? <clears throat> the conclusion is, number one, based on our missing insights, I was able to provide reservoir insights into the reservoir scale changes. Until today, it was only microbial insights. Today, we know that what might be expected in the reservoir just because of bioconversion. And in that, we re realized that bioconversion induced strains results in closure of cleat apertures. However, that doesn't happen if my fractures are more than five microns wide, okay? We also developed a poromechanical model and evaluated the, uh, <coughs> evaluated the performance of a bioconverted reservoir. And the modeling exercises revealed that there is a decrease in permeability, evidently because of loss of porosity. And we also were able to correlate imaging data with experimental data. In all this negativity, the silver lining was that wider fractures exhibited jump in permeability, which gives us a narrow selection criteria. Going on forward, we wouldn't select very deep, very high permeability coals for, oh, sorry, very, we wouldn't select very deep and very high permeability coals for bioconversion experiments. We would look at depleted coal bed methane reservoirs or CBM or coal reservoirs which have shallow, shallow depth and low, high permeability so that the, the aspect of widening of white fractures can be, uh, we can, we can cash in on it and not waste our resources on trying to bioconvert deep and low permeability CBM reservoirs. So before I conclude, I would like to thank Dr. Yana Liang and Dr. Ji Zhang who helped us with the microbial aspects of things and our granting agency, the Department of Energy. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, there, very good question. So the decrease in porosity, different images suggested differently. In few cases, there was direct blockage of cleats due to the biomass and biofilm production. And, but the basic observation was there was a swelling of the matrix. So in our other work, we, we took strain gauges and on a coal and we bioconverted it and we measured strain as they bioconverted. So there's a swelling of this matrix and that is usually because of uh, imbibation of water, and th that leads to inelastic strains. So the strains that are uh, observed in the coal due to the imbibation of water don't go away after we take the water out. So they are inelastic strains, and even uh, a lot of times CO2 is produced. And if you know anything about CO2 absorption in coals, it is, a lot of the times it's irreversible. So desorption is not the same as adsorption. So there are a lot of different processes going into this. These are a few of my guesses. Uh, a detailed study is due in order to accurately answer the question as to why is this really happening. If we have to go uh, deep, then it has to be at hydrostatic pressure. It has to, otherwise it's not gonna flow through. So is there any effort made to do something like fracking here instead of just feeding nutrients also keep the frac sand in there to keep the cores open? So uh, we tested four cores. I just presented the data from one. Two of them are fracked, but we did not have a propent that open, kept the fractures open. But uh, I think subsequent studies should look at fractured coal with propent induced fractures. But the problem with that is fracking coal <coughs> It's fine production. The problem is in fine production. So uh, if there is a means to have a jump in permeability of the in-situ coal reservoir, we need to look at that. So we did, but we did test fracked coal too in this study. And the results were similar. Uh, So uh, the question is whether am I, am, am I expecting the effect of microbes on the permeability response 
when under stress? Um, not that I can just tell. Um, they just, they, you know, from the movie, uh, you know, uh, she's, she's, she's an Asian. I can tell like, I'm, I'm probably Asian. It's very important. That's just that. Sometimes I do this person uh, based on mood changes or this man was So, uh, in trying to correct for the swelling stresses that we observed, we uh, treated the bulk modulus of the coal differently while on the bioconversion because think of, we know a reservoir is getting bioconverted, but we don't know how much of the reservoir is getting bioconverted. So, uh, to begin with, we had a constant bulk modulus, but we threw that out of the window and we derived using porosity and porosity and cleat parameters, a new approximate to the bulk modulus where, uh, Hang on. So this, uh, this is actually, so here you see the original bulk modulus, and this is just, this is an approximate of the bulk modulus times the strain. So one over cleat compressibility, uh, I was able to derive an equation that, we assumed constant cleat compressibility here, but this is an estimate of the variable bulk modulus due to bioconversion. These strains account for this swelling. So we were able to include that in our governing equation. Thank you. Thank you. Switch up here and switch to uh, carbon capture. Yes. <clears throat> so our third presentation for, for today is by Sriram Valuri, who is a researcher at the Michigan Tech University, working with Dr. Kumar, Kumar Kavatara. Uh, they are researching the possibility of utilizing CO2 from steel and coal industry for the past two years. Uh, Sriram has received his BS and MS in mineral processing from India. Sriram. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming to this presentation. I'm a graduate student at Michigan Technological University. And for the past two years, our group is focused on converting CO2 to useful products so that industry can make profits from it instead of just sequestering it underground. So still people might think that capturing CO2 if we are just sequestering it underground or in the ocean, it's just not giving us any economic advantage. But if we can utilize it the right way, if we can convert it to useful products, for example, if we can convert it to oxalic acid, which we are currently focused on, we can use oxalic acid for leaching rare earth minerals. And rare earth minerals are in higher advantage in electronics industry. So there we have, there we have an advantage of making profits. With that being said, I want to start with the capture process. For any chemical absorption CO2 capture process, the typical flow sheet looks like this, where we send the flue gas into the tall absorption column, also can be called as scrubbing column, and we send the scrubbing solution from the top of the column, and the CO2 loaded solution is again passed into the regenerator where CO2, pure CO2 is released with the heat, and the scrubbing solution is regenerated. And our research group has a patented technology for this, and we are using low-cost alkali absorbent solutions, and this research is being sponsored by Carbon Tech Energy Corporation, and our undergraduate researcher, Sam, he will be talking in detail about this process later in the next presentation. So I'll be talking more about utilization now. So since I talked about conver converting CO2 to oxalic acid, it can be done using two processes. One is thermochemical conversion and one is electrochemical conversion. But the disadvantage with thermochemical conversion is you need a lots of heat energy and it has to be done at higher temperatures and pressures. But as opposed to that, if we can develop efficient electrocatalysts, we can lower the energy barrier between the reactants and products and we can reduce the activation energy required for forming the products from the reactants. And since CO2 is thermodynamically highly stable, we can activate it at an electrocatalyst. The 
This table basically shows the energy cost of producing various products from CO2, starting from oxalic acid, which has the least energy in megajoules per kilogram produced, and methane has the highest energy cost for production. So we selected oxalic acid, and also hoping that it could be used for leaching rare earths. For our process, we took inspiration from a Texaco patent which uses the membrane electrolysis cell for their process. And we modified, the, we designed the cell according to our preference and we ordered the cell from Germany. And later we modified the cell because we observed that the membrane electrolysis cell as observed in the Texaco patent is not giving very efficient results. Like it's giving only 60% efficiency in the process. But our modified cell right now is giving 90 to 95 percent efficiency. The base uh, membrane electrolysis cell is a basic electrolysis cell with a cathode anode separated by a membrane ion exchange membrane, which separates the cell into two regions: catholite region and analyte region. If you take a closer look into the membrane, uh, when an electric field is applied it only allows counter ions to pass through the membrane barrier. The basic advantage of this is it minimizes the gas generation at the electrode, which minimizes the energy cost for production. And also it, it won't allow unnecessary movement of the charged species from one electrode to the other. So this diagram shows our process of how we are converting CO2. We are pumping CO2 into the analyte re catholyte region where the CO2 gets adsorbed at the cathode. And the cathode is polished to ensure there is a rough surface to make sure there are enough surface sites to be for the CO2 to get, to get adsorbed and for the electron transfer to happen. And as far as our reagents, we are using a a protic reagent, which is dimethyl formamide. We want to ensure there is no proton so that first the two CO2 molecules combine to form oxalate and then we want to add the proton. And tetraethyl ammonium bromide is our salt. And we'll talk more about orthotol nitride in the next slide. So since I mentioned the importance of first two reagents, in the electrochemical process, the catalyst is a most important species because it lowers the, as I mentioned before, the energy barrier between the reactants and products. Orthotolonitrile is an aromatic nitrile catalyst. So in our process, first the charge is transferred to the aromatic nitrile catalyst. It, it acts as the bit, bridge between the charge transfer. So then the charge is transferred to the CO2 and two CO2 molecules combined to form oxalate. So selection of electrode is very important in this process. We don't want any noble metals because they tend to generate more gases and that will reduce our, the efficiency of our process. That will cost us more money. And also we observed that lead, copper, and steel have a pronounced effect pronounced catalytic effect in this process. Like I said, uh, we were observing very less efficiencies with the membrane. So we had to modify the cell. We removed the membrane and we moved the electrodes closer to ensure more current density for less voltage, less voltage input. And uh, our zinc anode acts as a sacrificial anode providing zinc ions which will precipitate the oxalate that will later react with HCl for addition of proton since we are dealing with a protic solvent here. As far as the mechanism goes, first the electron from the cathode is transferred to aromatic nitrile catalyst and then from then from there the electron is transferred to the CO2 molecule and through nucleophilic addition, two CO2 molecules combine to form oxalate, and the zinc counter count Zn plus will precipitate this product, and that will later collect on and react with HCl. So that's 
uh, there you see the solid oxalate product that we collected from this cell. We, con we have conducted a number of experiments, but these are few of those where we achieved the high efficiencies, where we minimized the side products like zincite, etc. So we observed steel has the most catalytic effect in this process with 92% efficiency. So, like I mentioned, uh, Sam Root will discuss more about the capture process after this presentation, but we were successfully uh, making oxalic acid from CO2 with our electrochemical process, and we were able to achieve 90% efficiencies. Our next step is to estimate the cost of our production so that we could make profits. And also, we want to scale up this cell to the... So right now, we are capturing CO2 from the Michigan Tech steam plant with our CO2 capture column. And we want to uh, retrofit this electrolysis cell, scale up this cell and retrofit it to, the, to our existing CO2 capture setup. So thanks for listening. If you have any questions. Yes. So you're saying there's no CO2 from off gas that comes after the system? Actually, uh, uh, I misspoke. Like, we, we are capturing 100% CO2 from certain, uh, we are tapping into one of their economizers. So out of all the flue gas that we are getting into our system, that we are capturing all of it. Yeah. What kind of volumes are I talking about? So right now, our uh, scrubber was able to uh, handle like 20 ml, uh, 50 liters per minute of gases. Yeah, his presentation is Do you, you talk any about the sort of demand for this oxalate? Is there, I mean, do you know there's going to be a big demand or is this a... Uh, there's going to be, if we can produce it in bulk at low cost, then it can be used to, like people are right now researching on how to use acids for leaching rare earths in coal, from coal and other red mud, et cetera. So if we can prove that our process, it can be at low cost, then we can utilize that. Any other questions? Well, that's great then. Thank you, Sriram. Thank you.